Thanks. All right, let me get my uh, show on the road here. Okay, you see that? There it is. We sure do. Awesome. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is uh, just kind of go over some of the birds. Uh, all of these are ones that can be seen, not always seen, but can be seen in uh, our area. So it's not, so I won't be doing coastal birds uh, as much. Uh, I won't really, but uh, well, these are going to be birds that you see in the winter. So uh, this first photo obviously is the Northern Cardinals. I took this in my backyard during, I think this was Snowmageddon. So it's <laughs> Good cap people uh, were thinking of captions for this one, like, like when is this snow going to end? Oh gosh, that was. Uh, hopefully, we'll get some snow this year. So those are the northern cardinals, the state bird of Virginia. Notice the males have red bills, not yellow, as often shown. All right, so oops, what's happening? Okay, hold on. There we go. Okay, so uh, in the winter, our region is the south, south for a lot of birds, like these canvasback ducks. So people say, oh, birds fly south for the winter. Well, some of them come here because we are the south for these guys. I took this photo in Cambridge, Maryland. You can see the uh, sexual dimorphism between these ducks, which means the difference between male and female. The male is the more colorful one, as is usually the case with birds. So uh, really, if you think about it, there's four categories of uh, birds. There's birds that are here all the time. Like that one, whoops. Like the, there we go. Like this mockingbird here all the time. And they don't migrate. We have birds like the canvasbacks I showed you, which are only here in the winter. Then you have birds that are only here in the breeding season, like uh, certain warblers, uh, indigo buntings, flycatchers are here to breed. And then you have certain ones that only come through during migration in the fall and the spring. So there's a small window to see them. That's why we get so excited in May, because we see a lot of birds might be there our only chance to see them all year. But now we're talking about winter birds. So here's uh, something, there won't be a quiz, but just uh, if you hear me use certain uh, terminology, these are some of the things uh, we talk about, parts of a bird. Uh, when you're identifying birds, it's important to focus on some of these things. The crown, so you know, there's like white crown sparrows. This is the crown. Uh, the throat, often we'll look at that. We'll look at the uh, leg color, can be uh, very important. How long the tail is, the rump, yellow rumped warblers have yellow here. This is what we call, refer to as the rump. So when you're identifying birds, uh, birders don't always look at the same field mark. Like sometimes you have something that you notice as, as a birder yourself, maybe more than another birder does. And that's kind of the field mark you focus on. Because sometimes you don't have a lot of time to, to see the bird, unless you get a photo. But uh, so, and then uh, then the head, we talk about lores sometimes. That's a word you might not be familiar with, but it's this area between the beak and the eye, this lores. That's important. Sometimes uh, the throat patches. Sometimes we call, this area is called a whisker. And then uh, the eye line, especially with sparrows, this eye line can be really key to identifying sparrows. And then uh, if the bird has an eye ring, like this ruby crown kinglet, then uh, that can be really a diagnostic field mark that can help you uh, identify it really quick. So all of these photos I'm going to show you are mine. I've taken them over the years. And some of them are just in the past few weeks. So I, I refreshed the program just for you. <laughs> All right. So in the winter, we have a lot more raptors. Here's a couple of bald eagles. I took this at Pohick Bay. Uh, you can see that the one on the left is larger, right? That is the female eagle. In raptors, the females are larger than the males. 
and uh there's different reasons for that i think it's so uh they can they can lay eggs and they can defend their nests from uh, predators and things but uh, generally the, the females are larger and that's true not with eagles but like I said with all raptors hawks also so here's what we call excipiters we have a sharp shinned hawk and a cooper's hawk these are the only excipiters we have in our area except the once in a very very rarely i've never even seen one in virginia you could get a goshawk migrating through the mountains but an american goshawk but both of these are juveniles which is the ones we see more often and they are hard to tell apart but if you look at the one on the right the cooper's hawk it's got this uh really extensive neck projection the head projection whereas on a sharp shin talk it's almost like they say it's almost like an ice cream cone it's just it's just smooth there's not a lot of uh neck to be seen the tail's a bit shorter and the streaking on uh on the cooper sock is more crisp these are both juveniles as i mentioned so uh, sometimes the hawk watchers will call the sharp shinned hawk a uh, pinhead because when they fly over they don't have you know you just kind of see a really little head you don't see the big neck so i'll show you an adult it's the next one so this is this is from my backyard this is what the adult will look like. Uh, the adult sharp shin will look similar also. So it's actually even harder to tell the adults apart. But the uh, Cooper's hawks are larger than sharp shin. Sometimes I call sharp shin uh, mini Coopers. Little bird joke. But anyway, Russ got it. <laughs> so, but uh, you can see the cap. You can see this one. Um, I caught him just as, I think this is a her, I think. I caught hers because it was big. I caught her just as she was finishing this meal. I'm um, hoping it was a house sparrow. I'm not a big house sparrow fan, but who knows? Probably a dove. They seem to eat a lot of doves. But you can see that cap on the head. You can see that uh, there is somewhat of a neck. All the, the, the tail is very long. Coopers, The Coopers have a very long tail. And the exhibitors are designed to chase birds through the woods. So they're, they're, they're shaped... Their wings are shaped and their tails for maximum acceleration and maneuverability. So here's the other kind. We have Budios. These are This is a red-shouldered hawk. One of the most common hawks we have in our area. In fact, I'd say most areas, the default Budio is the red-tailed hawk, which I'll show you in a moment. But I think in our area, the red-shouldered is more common. They love these uh, bottomland uh, stream valley parks. So you can see the pattern. You can see the sort of checkerboard pattern on the wings, the shape, and they're 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 not the same shape. They're they're kind of broader, broader than those exhibitors. Exhibitors are really lean. Um, here's a red-shouldered hawk in flight, and a good way to tell, you can see here. See how it's sort of you can see through these areas here on the wing. We call those the windows. So. If you're seeing if you're seeing a bird, and also I'll show you on the next one, but there's no petigial, there's no marking here, which is called the petigial uh, markings. We don't have that on the red sh shouldered hawk, and also red shouldered hawks are very loud, <laughs> so you might if they're calling, they're pretty unmistakable. Here's the red-tailed hawk. This is our other beautio. Now these, you can see this one. This one's puffed up from the cold. Birds will puff themselves up to stay warm. But you can see this belly band here. It's all white with this belly band. And uh, you can see here in the markings I mentioned that the red shoulder does not have, the red tail does have these black marks on the leading edge of the wing. This one has a red tail, so it's obvious. But sometimes uh, the juvenile red-tailed hawks do not have a red tail. So that makes it a little confusing. But look for these markings on the leading edge of the wing, and that will clinch it. Every red-tailed hawk that ever lived, no matter the age, no matter the sex, no matter the part of the country, always has this mark here. And the others do not. Okay. So here's our vultures. We have two species of vultures. 
turkey vultures, which we call TVs, and black vultures. TVs, uh, they're both, I think they're both about even in uh, uh, frequency around here. Uh, obviously, you can see the, the head color, if you can see it. The turkey vulture has the uh, pinkish head. Black vulture has the uh, gray head. But really what you want to look for is the wings. Longer wings on the turkey vulture, shorter wings on the black vulture, and the silver tips on the end. Um, interesting fact, the turkey vultures have an amazing sense of smell. So they, they can find uh, something dead. They only eat dead things. And they can find something from miles away, whereas the black vultures will hunt more, um, they'll go more by sight. Or they'll follow the turkey vultures around and depend on the turkey vultures to find the stuff for them. And then they'll just kind of horn in on it, you know. So sometimes you'll see them together. Um, the other thing about turkey vultures is they will, uh, when they're flying, they'll tilt their wings up like this and kind of teeter around. Sometimes we say um, TVs teeter. So they'll kind of go like this. The black vultures more fly, more flat. That's another thing to look for. Um, by the way, um, if you see two turkey vultures, we call that a TV set, just so you know. <laughs> I think I ran over a squirrel the other day. That was a TV dinner. So anyway, if you're, if you're really, see, I can't hear people laughing, but I see Russ. Um, if you're really <laughs> lucky, you might, thank you. If you, if you, if you're really lucky, you might see a peregrine falcon. I took this photo in uh, actually the dry tortugas. But uh, we do get peregrines around here on occasion. So you might see one. The fastest bird in the world, of course. And they're, they're really awesome. I saw one take out a red-winged blackbird uh, once. It just uh, picked it out of the flo a huge flock and drove it into the ground. It was amazing. So uh, if you see one, that'd be great. Okay, we have owls around here. This is the barred owl, the most common owl we have. They again, they love these uh, these stream valleys, and you may have heard them calling in the woods. Have you ever been there? They go, "Who cooks for you?" Right, the "Who cooks for y'all?" Um, so I'm not going to show every bird you could possibly see. I'm just kind of giving you some of the highlights. So this is one of the owls. We also, you could also see a uh, great horned or Screech, a few others. Now, if you're really, really lucky, you might see this one, the Snowy Owl. Now, they're not down this year so far, but uh, this one was at Springfield Mall years ago, and uh, I photographed it at the Springfield Mall. They actually used this photo in the Washington Post uh, website. Uh, reporter talked to me, and I sent him my photo. So uh, we'll see. There, they have, there was one at Manassas Airport, before so you never know but uh they're uh the best place to see them though would probably be the airports so because they love they love uh open areas because they're evolved to hunt the tundras which is totally wide open so airport is kind of like that so all right now we'll talk about the waterfowl so a lot of the ducks will come down here for the winter they're a lot more abundant. This is the South for them. So we do a Northern Virginia Bird Club. We do a trip to the Northern Neck each January, and we can get like 14 kinds of ducks there, including uh, sea ducks and things like that out on the big part of the Potomac River. So, uh, but uh, these are ones we can see around Prince William County, like this gadwall. Uh, this is a male. So a good way to tell, it's got this uh, black butt. You can that black butt really stands out, even from a distance. And it's got this really puffy head here. Okay. Again, if anybody has questions, feel free. So that's the gadwall. Females are more uh, what we call cryptic coloration. They're not going to be as colorful. I'll show you some females. The others. Okay. Here's a. Hooded merganser. This is a recent photo. I took this at Brick Lake. So that's the male in front. Very resplendent, showing off. 
And he's got those two females with him who kind of have a punk rock haircut, looks like almost. So uh, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's got it going on, I think. <laughs> it's lucky to get this one in good light. Photography is all about the light. So uh, they were just cruising around on Burke Lake. <laughs> and uh, Hood and Mergansers are kind of interesting because uh, they do actually breed in our area, especially at uh, Huntley Meadows. They'll use the uh, wood duck boxes at Huntley Meadows to breed in. They'll lay their eggs in there. Um, but the wood ducks use them too, so we call those uh, hoodie woody boxes. And uh, actually, the hooded merganser is our uh, sponsor bird for the Northern Virginia Bird Club for the uh, Virginia Breeding Bird Atlas too, which was a five-year effort done where we uh, we we uh, collected data on breeding birds throughout the entire state, and now they're working on uh, publishing it, and they've hired an editor. The, the Virginia Society of Ornithology. It's a big effort. So when they when they make it, it will be awesome. But we uh, we we pitched in money for them. Our sponsor bird was that. So uh, and anyway, these guys leave like at the end of summer, once or in the middle of summer, and then they'll come back in like November. So it's kind of an odd life cycle they have. Whoops, went back. All right, here's our mallards. These are birds that are always here. They don't migrate. Um, again, you can see the uh, difference between the male and the female. Females are going to be much more, uh, I guess you'd say, well, the, the technical term is cryptic coloration, but not as colorful because they uh, don't want to call a lot of attention to themselves when they're on the nest or with the uh, babies. But the males, they want to show off. They want to attract the female, so they're going to be colorful. All right, here's pintails. This is another dabbling duck. All the ones we've seen so far are called dabbling ducks. They're not going to be in the ocean. They're going to be on ponds and rivers and things like that. And they'll be inland. So uh, you can see how it's called a pintail. The male has this big pin, a big, big long tail. All right, here's a northern shoveler. This is one of my favorites. They got that big giant bill, and they do. You can see he's been shoveling. He's got <laughs> he's got a vegetation on his bill there. So they will actually use that bill to uh, go down and, and dig out stuff. And uh, this is a male. Very, very pretty ducks. But funny looking with that big bill, I think. Although they probably don't think they are themselves. So that's, again, you'll see these on the ponds. These are ring neck ducks, males, and then the female is the brown one. And uh, there's another bird. Uh, it's kind of an odd name. It's kind of a bad name. Really, they should be ring billed ducks, right? You can see the rings on their bills. But apparently, whoever named them had them in hand. And uh, apparently, they do have rings on their necks. If you <laughs> look carefully enough, apparently. But uh, I don't know. Maybe they should rename them. But there's a ring neck bill, ring bill gull, so maybe that would be confusing. I don't know. But uh, anyway, but a good thing to look for them is they have this black on the backs, the males do. Uh, there's another similar duck called a lesser scop, which you will find usually on larger bodies of water. Not always, but they're, uh, they don't have the black on the back. So you can check that out. All right. Here's a couple of green wing teal. Um, got these guys out of the water just because I like the photo. But again, you can see the male on the left. Um, good thing with these guys to look for is this vertical white stripe on the duck. And these are smaller guys. They're smaller ducks than the others. And uh, they'll often be in fairly big groups. And again, the females here. Female female ducks can be pretty, can be hard to tell. Uh, if you're if they're not with a male, this one's with a male, so it's pretty easy. But um, what you want to look for is the bill shape and color, size and shape of the bird, because they're all kind of the same brown. It can be tricky. All right, here's a bufflehead, one of my favorites. These guys, uh, again, you'll see them in groups. This is the male. Uh, this one I caught in good light. Get the iridescence there. 
These are fairly small ducks also. And these are a little more versatile. You'll find them uh, on the ocean, but you also find them uh, inland on lakes and uh, ponds and things sometimes. Buffalo head, kind of cool. All right, now let's talk about the woodpeckers. We can get seven kinds of woodpeckers in our area. Uh, most of the time you can only see six, but I'll show you there is a seventh one that appears in the winter. This is our famous uh, pileated woodpecker. They have the big call, sounds like a, a maniac's laugh, sort of. They're they're uh, they're a call, and it's kind of got the big the big crest. They're, this is a big big impressive bird, and when you hear them peck, it's pounding. It sounds like somebody's pounding a hammer. You know, get that big bill. Here's a couple more. Uh, this is from the feeder red bellied woodpecker. They've got a so sometimes I mean, I wrote an article about this for someone. Uh, difference between a red-headed woodpecker and a red-bellied. Sometimes people mistakenly call the red-bellied a red-headed. It says, "Well, he's got red on his head." Well, no, he's only got red on part of his head. You can see, and he's got this checkerboard pattern. Whereas the red-headed woodpecker, which is not going to be at your feeder very often, they have they look like someone's picked up the bird and dipped it in a, a bucket of red paint. So, except for the bill. But uh, say so the whole head is red. And they have this beautiful uh, pattern, the white, black and white pattern on the back. You can really see that when they fly. Um, these guys are going to be more, they seem to move around. They're at Huntley Meadows right now. Seems like they'll be at one place and then they'll leave for a few years. Then they'll come back. So, uh Never know, but uh, they they seem to like uh, areas that are kind of near water. Oftentimes, it seems to me. But uh, these red bellies are very common, just everywhere. Though, if you put up suet feeders, you'll get a red bellied woodpecker almost guaranteed. So, all right, here's a couple of ones that people get mixed up: the downy woodpecker and the hairy woodpecker. Downies are again; they're both of these will come to your feeders, but the downy is more common. It's smaller. I've heard it's the softest woodpecker. I mean, who knows? Uh, but uh, smaller bill, you can see on the on the hair, it's got a giant bill here. Another good way to tell them apart, you can see on the tail feathers, this one has black spots. This one does not. It's clean, clean tail feathers. So sometimes, you know, when when they're when they're isolated, it can be hard to tell. Um, another thing to look for is uh, the, uh, it's a little hard to see, but you can sort of see it. The Harry's have this spur here, right right under its neck. There's like this spur, whereas the uh, downy really doesn't have that. It'd be a very distinctive. But really what you're looking for is this just really huge bill and whether they're spots or not. And it's just a bigger bird, but it can be confusing to tell them apart. All right, here's a couple more we have. The uh, yellow, this is the northern flicker. There's uh, two subspecies in our country. We got we have the yellow shafted here. You can see the yellow on the tail. This is, uh, these are here all the time. Now here's our winter visitor, the yellow-bellied sapsucker. This is a new uh, photo I just took at Blandy Farm out near Winchester, that direction. And uh, this one flew. Very nice. He flew right up next to us and sat there for long enough for me to get his photo. You can see the yellow belly. This is a male. He's got all the red on the bill. Very colorful. So, uh, and what they do is they will actually, uh, they'll peck a bunch of little holes in a tree, like in a pattern. Uh, they'll make straight rows of, of holes. And then they'll actually uh, suck the sap out of it. And they'll get... They'll eat the sap, but also any bugs that were trapped in the sack in the sap to give them more protein. So uh, they do actually suck sap. It's an apt name. And again, they leave. They'll leave uh, at the end of winter. All right. Yeah, we got our little brown jobs, which are the sparrows and things like that. So uh, these are two of our most common sparrows: the song sparrow on the left. Um, good way to tell these, they have this long tail, very long tail, heavy streaking on the breast, 
and they'll often have this little uh, brown spot here too. You can see. So uh, they're 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 pretty ubiquitous. And then our swamp sparrows looks different. Very dark looking sparrow. Um, these are going to be more in wetlands. Go, you'll get song sparrows at your feeders. Uh, so swamp sparrows not so much. Maybe maybe once in a while. But they're very uh, they're very dark. Rufusy uh, wings, gray head. So uh, that's kind of what you want to look for. All right, that's the swamp sparrow. And again, uh, here's the white throated sparrows. So I have two pictures. What can you tell between the two? There's a difference. This one has a white over the eye. You can see the eye line eyebrow this one is tan so uh, this is one of my favorite photos on the left because i got paid 125 dollars for it <laughs> somebody yeah i know somebody just uh i had it on Flickr or somewhere i think yeah and someone just uh uh wrote messaged me out of the blue hey can we use your photo in our book and says oh sure and they said oh we'll pay you 125 dollars okay double sure yes <laughs> so I just sent them the file, and it's in the book. It's called uh, Secrets of Backyard Birding Success. And uh, I just took this at random. I was there to see the uh, varied uh, bunting, varied thrush in someone's backyard that was there. Um, anyway, as I was mentioning about the white-throated sparrows, some of them have this white, some of them have this tan over the eye. And these are not, it has nothing to do with age, nothing to do with sex. Nothing to do with part of the country they're from. Um, it's just a different morph. But the two morphs have different personalities. The ones with the white are more aggressive and just a little more hyper, whereas these with the tan are more mellow and uh, kind of dependable, you might say. So actually, uh, turns out the different morphs generally breed with each other, not their own morph. So... Uh, Someone did, some woman, I don't remember her name, but she did a lot of research with this. And uh, the theory, I think, is uh, the, the aggressive females, they want these tan guys because they're better, they're better partners. So, so the white guys are taken by the tan females because those are the only ones left. That's one theory, you know, one, one hypothesis. But they definitely tend to breed. I mean, it's not every time, but it tends to be that they'll breed with the other morph. So it's kind of an interesting thing. And these are here in the, uh, only here in the winter. And they're very common. I'd say these are the most common sparrow in the winter. You can get big flocks of them. And they have, uh, they're one of the few birds that you'll hear singing in the winter. They do a, uh, the mnemonic is poor Sam Peabody Peabody. If you hear it, <laughs> go to Cornell website, you'll, you'll hear it. So uh, those are pretty good. All right, here's our uh, juncos. Yeah, I'm sure you've seen these. These will come to your feeders. Sometimes these are called snowbirds. And they're, again, all here in the winter. But they, uh, unless you go to Skyline Drive, where you can find them in the summer, they actually, it's high enough for them to be up there on uh, Skyline Drive in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Because... Uh, Altitude is latitude. So you get birds that are generally um, up north in higher latitudes. They will be at higher altitudes because the uh, habitat and climate is, is similar to the more northern latitudes. So that's why uh, we go, uh, the Northern Virginia Bird Club will go to the Limber Lost Trail in June. And we'll find uh, all sorts of cool warblers and uh, different uh, ro rose-breasted grosbeaks, broad-winged hawks, just a lot of stuff you can't find down at lower, down near sea level where we are. All right, so the one on the right is the field sparrow, one of my favorite sparrows. And uh, I like this photo, it's got a lot of color. Um, I always like, they have the big eye ring, little pink bill, this is a little sparrow. And I always think they have kind of a blank expression on their face. Like, it's like, what's going on? And these uh, these are here all year. 
they do breed in our area. And their song is uh, sounds like a ping pong ball bouncing down the stairs. It kind of goes, speeds up as it goes. So if you hear that, that's going to be a field sparrow. One of my favorites. All right, here's a picture I took at Dyke Marsh a year ago. It's a fox sparrow. These are uh, really beautiful sparrows. They've got this uh, really nice, beautiful roof. You can see why they're called a fox sparrow. They have this beautiful reddish rufous color this pattern. They have a grayish head. Um, this guy posed pretty nicely for me. And uh, they're larger. They're one of the large. They're larger than a lot of the other sparrows. So they're around. I've seen a few this year. So uh, you might you might see one of those. They're not as common as the other sparrows, but they're here. All right, here's one of my. This might be my very favorite. This is the white crown sparrow. Beautiful. These are more likely to be in a fields in more rural areas. You see them, and uh, they're just just stunning. Just just this their crown just just. It just really stands out and and they have a this big uh, orangey bill and uh, again compare that to the white throated sparrow these don't have the white throat so they got the white crown right and they're a little larger too they're a little larger sparrow so this one was just on the side of the road and pulled over and there he was and posed for me all right and then another bird we can see is the eastern tohi they are actually considered a sparrow. So uh, this is a male, very, very colorful. And uh, they're, they're not as common in the winter. They're here in the winter, but you won't see as many. But uh, they're very common in the breeding season. But I included it because you, you can usually get, you should get one or two on the day in the winter if you're doing a Christmas bird count. So uh, they're around. But uh, yeah, they, uh, they have, uh, when they sing, they probably won't be singing in the winter, but when they sing in the spring, uh, they say, uh, drink your tea. That's their the mnemonic. Drink your tea. So we'll that I don't have any tea. Sorry. All right. Here's a couple more little brown jobs you could see. This is a Carolina wren. Now, the one on the left was in my yard in a big another big snowstorm. I think I probably saved his life because I kept putting seeds out for him and and I don't know if he would have been able to find much more because he mostly roots around uh, on the ground. So uh, I think uh, I think I helped him out. And then uh, winter wren, Carolina wrens are here all year, by the way. And uh, they're very loud. They're probably gram for gram one of the loudest birds. And they have several different calls they do. Um, one is the tea kettle, tea kettle song. You could might hear that. And then on the right, we have the winter wren. Um, appropriately, you'll only see them here in the winter. I've seen a few this year. I just saw one on Sunday, actually, over at Wolf Trap. And uh, they're around. They're a little more skulky. Uh, they hide. They'll hide more than the uh, uh, Carolina wren will. But uh, you'll see them. You can see those, see those little claws there. Pretty cool. Um, they're going to be usually be low low on the ground, like maybe behind logs, uh, in 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 it, on the on, in the woods, in in more uh, kind of damp areas. Look for them there, but uh, they do have some distinctive calls. They do too. So check it. They're like they're cool. They're just a like little little brown ball, little brown ball bird there. <laughs> and uh, oh, I got a the uh, there's one out west called the Pacific Wren which used to be the same species considered as the winter wren, but then they uh, split it. So I got a life bird out of that. So we always like that. If you're a, uh, if you do lists <laughs> of your birds, sometimes the powers that be will decide that a certain bird is its own species and you get a life bird magically appear. It's like magic. Or you might lose one if they decide, well, that's not a species. Tough luck. <laughs> so anyway, it's a little esoterica about the listing, but uh, anyway, um, all right, let's see what else we got. Oh, this is one of them, one of the more popular birds people see. These cedar wax wings, you can see the beautiful yellow tip here and the mask. Very, this was the bird of the year for the uh, 
American Bird Association a couple years ago, I think. But these guys will be uh, generally in fairly big flocks, and they will fly around from place to place. They're very nomadic. They'll pretty much show up, eat all the berries in the area, and then move on and find more berries to eat. And uh, sometimes they'll find ones that are a little bit uh, possibly fermented. They'll get a little bit uh, drunk sometimes. It's been known to happen. But but anyway, but uh, you can see um, this little yellow on the tail that actually has a function. They will uh, use that to kind of signal the other birds that uh, they found uh, a food source. So everybody's like looking, looking, looking for food. And then uh, say, hey, that guy over there, I mean, he's found something. There, I see his tail there. He's found something. So they'll all come in and start the feast. So, uh, yeah. And they're here all year, but uh, they don't go in the flocks as much uh, in the breeding season because they pair up to nest, of course. So, uh, but uh, always, always a treat to see those guys. All right, here's a belted kingfisher. I just like this one because it's got a big old fish in its mouth. Hey, Larry, we have a question about. Oh, sure, the, go ahead. Um, uh, is the cedar waxwing? Sorry, is the cedar waxwing in the sparrow family? No, it is not. So I was out of the little brown. Dog. The last sparrow was the uh, towhee. Yeah, they're not. So uh, let's see. We had yeah, and the wrens are not sparrows either. So. This was the last sparrow. Yeah, I can't remember what about, but these are, yeah, these are wrens, not sparrows, but still considered little brown jobs. <laughs> okay. That's a good question. And that, yeah, this is not a sparrow. So uh, anyway, so uh, good question. So this is a belted kingfisher. Um, this is one of the, this is actually a female, one of the few species of birds where the females are actually more colorful. The males don't have this red band on the breast they just have the blue so you could actually call this a belted queen fisher right because it's a female there you go <laughs> but uh, this one this was in alexandria it's just had this big mouthful of fish oh i gotta get that <laughs> so, looking at me she's like what are you interrupting my meal <laughs> oh yeah. so Here's the probably the only warbler you're going to see uh, regularly is this yellow rumped warbler. Um, can't see the rump here, but this yellow here is a good field mark, and uh, they'll they'll fly around in little flocks. And uh, the reason we have them is because they are able to uh, eat the berries, so they can change they can change their diet. And uh, because most warblers can only eat insects for the most part, these guys can't eat other. So they're, uh, you may have heard them called myrtle warblers. That was what their old name was. Used to be a split uh, myrtle warblers here, Audubon warblers out west. And then they lumped them together. Now they're just all called yellow rump warblers. But uh, usually uh, some winters though, we don't seem to have them. So it seems uh, variable. But I've seen them so far on all my trips this on my walks this year. So we'll see if they hang out. Um, but if you go to the uh, coast, like Chincoteague or Cape May or somewhere like that, they're everywhere. They're just they just they uh, they really doesn't matter every winter. There there's a bunch of them on the coast. So Eastern Shore of Virginia, just a lot of them. So uh, you there's a few other warblers. I mean, you might see a palm warbler. We've occasionally seen those, but this is the one you really, if you see a warbler, it's very likely this one. Um, affectionately known as butter butts, right? Because of the yellow rump. So, uh, yep. All right, here's a couple other little guys you'll see. Obviously, the one on the left is not a winter picture, but it's, <laughs> that's okay. Um, Carolina chickadees, uh, Antarctica titmouse, they don't migrate, they're always here. And by the way, we don't have black cap chickadees here, only the Carolina chickadees. You'll have to go uh, out to the uh, far western Virginia or go north and uh, well into Pennsylvania to get black capped. And uh, Carolina chickadees, um, they're interesting because their calls mean uh, have a lot of meanings and the other birds understand them. For example, uh, 
if there's a threat coming from above, they have a different call, like like a hawk or something from above, a different call than something coming from below. So if there's like a snake coming up the tree or people or whatever, it's a different call. And the other birds that are in the area understand it. So they will react to what the chickadee says. He's like, he'll give the warning and they know whether to look up or look down and where to fly. So uh, very handy to hang out with them. And uh, if you have a migrating warbler, especially in the fall, they will hang out with the chickadees and the titmice too. Titmice are also, because, you know, they know the area where the food is and they're very good at centuries too. And uh, chickadees, the more Ds you hear, the more upset they are. So they got chickadee, D, 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 that they're upset. A couple of Ds, yeah, they're pretty mellow. So anyway, a right, couple more uh, white breasted nut hatch are here all the time. You'll see them on trees. Um, so come into your feeders. Um, red breasted, I've not seen one this year. They're what's known as an eruptive species with an I, R, I, R, R, U, P, T, I, V, E. Uh, sometimes they come down from Canada or, or Maine or wherever up north uh, from the boreal forest. Sometimes they do not. It depends on the food situation up north, whether they're going to come down here or not. And uh, so sometimes if we get lucky, we'll see them. Uh, we'll see. And uh, usually there's a few around, but some years there's a lot of them. So just kind of luck of the draw on the food situation up, month, up north. All right, a couple more things. Here's the kinglets. Remember, I mentioned the kinglet earlier. Ruby crowned on the left, golden crown on the right. Um, these are little guys, very little birds. They're always moving around. They're like an electron. They're like quantum birds, always moving. So they're uh, check. It's a little. It's gonna be a little green bird with a big eye ring. That's the ruby crown. Um, golden crown. If you don't see the yellow, which you might not because it's moving so fast, but you can see this pattern on the face and no eye ring. So that's going to be a golden crown. Golden crowns are seem like more often in flocks, little flocks. Rubies seem to be more uh, a solo act to me. So uh, more solitary than the, than the goldens. Uh, goldens look for, uh, this happened to be my front yard, but goldens uh, look for in pine trees and things like that too, more often. Rubies can be kind of anywhere. All right, here's our winter visitor, the brown creeper. Brown creepers, look for them. They're pretty much always on the side of a tree like this. <laughs> so they'll uh, they'll start they'll start on a tree, they'll go up. They only go up. I've never seen one coming down. They'll go up and up and then they'll fly away from that tree go to another tree and start up that one <laughs> land lower on another tree and then start going up that one and what they're doing is looking for little bugs to pick out of the bark so uh they're always always cool when we see those and they're they're fairly common you, you, if you go on a bird walk you'll probably see one or two maybe maybe more but uh always a treat to see them again only here in the winter so uh, here's the only thrush we'll have that's called a thrush this is a hermit thrush. Um, Swainson's thrush, wood thrush, not here. So uh, you can see it has a, this brown body, but it's got this sort of reddish tail. That's a good field mark for hermit thrush. And it's a, it's a medium-sized bird. All right, we also have bluebirds. So uh, they're, they're again, they are considered a thrush, but I'm just saying the one called a thrush, hermit thrush is the only one. But bluebirds are considered a thrush, and they're here uh, all year. And they breed here. Um, I actually do uh, probably a few. You probably some of you do uh, bluebird trails, where we monitor the boxes and and uh, kick out the house sparrows and raise the babies. So uh, that's always fun. I have a uh, in Vienna. I have a, a trail with thirteen boxes. Fortunately, there's other people on the team, so I don't have to do it every day. But this is a male hanging out. And American robins we have. Uh, obviously not, not in the uh, winter, but that's okay. I like the photo. Um, not a sign of spring. They're here all year. So, But there is some movement. Some of them will move out of the area. Some of the ones from the north move into the area. And then some of them just stay in the area. 
but what they will do is flock up. So you'll see, you can see big flocks of robins, even like hundreds of them flying around in the winter. Whereas you don't see that in the spring because they're nesting, right? So, all right, a couple of corvids, fish crow and American crow. Those are our two crows we have. Um, you might see a raven. I don't have, I don't have that one, but, but uh, fish crow, really the only way to tell them apart is the uh, call. Fish crows go, uh, 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 American crows go, caw, caw, caw. Um, you have to ask them, are you an American crow? If they say, uh, uh, they're a fish crow. That's the way to figure it out. And a blue jay, also a corvid. That's why blue jays are so smart and so loud because they are related to crows. They're both, they're also corvids. Okay. Um, yeah, we got the blackbirds, female, male and female blackbirds. They have uh, sexual dimorphism, which means uh, a very, we saw that with the ducks, right? The sexual dimorphism, very different uh, look between the males and the females. So uh, uh, usually in the winter, the males aren't going to have quite as big epaulets as this. This is more of a spring, look, early spring look. But uh, anyway, just to show you. Sure, you've seen that. This is the female. Now, people get confused about this because they look so different than the males. But, you know, look for uh, it's a little larger than a sparrow. It's got this eye line here, this heavy, heavy streaking. Um, this one happens to be eating a dragonfly at the moment. But uh, that that's what you want to look for with the, the female red winged blackbirds. Um, that, that can be a hard idea for some sometimes. So again, the, the eye line, the eye line, and the heavy streaking, and size bigger than the sparrow. Okay, okay. I have a little story about this wall of blackbirds. I was in on the eastern shore of Virginia, uh, looking for birds. This was years ago, and uh, they have they they get huge flocks of blackbirds out there. And uh, I was driving the car on a back on a small back road, and uh, this. Huge flock of blackbirds just enveloped my car. I couldn't drive. I was blackout. It was a blackout of birds. So I took this photo through the windshield of the car. Uh, these are all blackbirds. You can see there's little patches of red here. Those are the red-winged blackbirds you can see uh, here and there. But uh, I think it was a mixed group of uh, all sorts of blackbirds. So, uh, yeah. Uh, fortunately, no one was coming, so I was safe. I was fine. <laughs> but uh, that was... Uh, that was amazing. All right, here's a couple more. We have the grackles. Uh, a little bit bigger. They have the long tail. That's the main thing to look for. And if you get in the right light, they have this bluish look about them. I'm sure you've seen those at your feeders. They can be kind of pests. Uh, the cowbirds, which are, uh, we have them. They're a little less common in the winter, but they're around. Uh, that's the male on the left, the brown-headed, and the females. This is like the most uh, generic looking bird you can have almost. Really got to look at the bill to tell a female cowbird. But uh, these are the ones that are parasites. They will lay their eggs in other birds' nests. So, uh, and uh, they, they've learned a lot about that. They've found that they actually do kind of keep track of uh, the nests where they're, uh, where they've laid their eggs. And, uh, kind of keep in contact with them once they're born because people wonder how do you know how do they know they're a cowbird once because they, they've been raised by a warbler or something but uh, there are ways okay and then here's we hope we see these these are a little more rare but they're around um, generally only in the winter these are rusty blackbirds they're a little smaller sometimes confused with grackles a little smaller shorter tail they have this big eye you can see both of them it's a female on the left male on the right you see this big yellow eye. That's what you're going to look for in the rusty blackbird. Plus their call. It sounds like a rusty gate opening. So look for the big eye, rusty gate. And these can be in big flocks too sometimes. Um, these are going to be in wetter areas usually. They get them at Huntley Meadows. Uh, and they'll get them, uh, you'll get them at some of the wetlands around uh, Prince William County. Yep. All right. And then our finches, house finch. See, it's got the reddish. It's not a purple finch, which uh, I haven't seen one of those this year, but they might be. Around. But it has the, uh, you know, it's whitish streaky down here. 
and then red up here. That's a house finch. And then the goldfinch, that is a goldfinch. I know uh, we think of them as being bright yellow, but in the winter, they lose that bright yellow because keeping your colors takes a lot of energy. So uh, this is what they're going to look like. All right. And there's our great blue heron, another one that doesn't migrate. This is really the only heron you're likely to see because the others have migrated. But these guys stay around all year. I like this photo from the, the reflection and all that. All right. And here's some links in case you're interested. Um, we got the Prince William, Friends of Dyke Marsh. Um, that's a good one if you happen to make your way up to Dyke Marsh. Uh, the, uh, on the GW Parkway, uh, we do walks there every Sunday morning. I lead those sometimes. Virginia Bluebird Society. Here's the Virginia Breeding Bird Atlas. I mentioned uh, different different things I've done over the years. And thank you very much. This is a Magnolia Warbler. Uh, sending season's greetings from the tropics. They're not here right now, but we'll see you next spring, buddy. So uh, there you go. Thank you so much. That's terrific, yeah. Larry. Thank you. And yeah. I love the story about the um, the white-throated. I didn't realize that those yeah. were uh, the two morphs. Mm -hmm. The fact that they tend to breed with each other. Uh, from the, yeah. Yeah, the opposite kind of morph. morph. Yeah, exactly. That's, Thanks, Eileen. Uh, that was really interesting. So does anyone, uh, if you have a question or a comment, just go ahead and unmute yourself and come on in. She wants to know uh, the slide. Yeah, you can. The recording will be available, or uh, I could I could send you the slides too. If you you could send them the link. I yep. said you have the link. Yeah, she, yeah. She can send you the link to the slides. Yep, no problem. Jack, did you want to say something? Oh yeah, thank you very much. I just want to thank you, Larry. I I really appreciate the basic terminology, the morphology of the bird parts. Is very very helpful, and you have a way of mm -hmm. instructing and teaching that is really wonderful. Thank you. No thanks. Really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. Well, appreciate yeah, that it. was. Uh, Thank uh, you. Good. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, that was uh, really informative and, and I mean interesting, uh, especially about the birds that uh, I guess use different tones to warn yeah you know of uh something's coming you know something's coming from above and someone's coming something's coming yeah, from you know below mm -hmm. yeah yeah wow mm -hmm. that was interesting that's why you yeah. want to hang out with chickadees because they know what's going on that's right <laughs> yeah right. They, they keep things uh they they're on the lookout a lot and yep. you can definitely tell that by watching them <laughs> yeah we we had uh uh 55 species at uh meadow wood today during the survey that's good i got a good picture of the uh of the hermit thrush nice yeah we had uh, they're around we had 53 at aquan bay on uh, saturday so yeah there uh there's birds around <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. Nice to see you. Yeah, see I might join you guys on the twentieth. I think you have. Yeah, I'll be off. So anyway, great. Um, were there yeah, more yeah. questions in the chat, or any, or just uh... a lot of kudos? Okay, um, well, I very, appreciate that. Very informative. Great presentation. Beautiful um, photos. Of course, Betsy, we do. Um, um, I lead a trip. You can, uh, if you join the Northern Virginia Bird Club, you're welcome to come. Uh, all our walks are actually, you don't need to be a member, but except for our out of town trips. But we go to, thanks for us. We go to uh, what's called, we go to George Washington Birthplace and we go to uh, LaGrange Lane, which is another road, uh, which has tons of ducks. We can get 50 species just on that road alone sometimes. So. And then we go to the Big Water Muse Lane to see uh, long-tailed ducks, golden eyes, loons, stuff like that. So it's a nice trip. Yeah. All righty. All right. Well, I hope you all enjoyed it.
Yeah. And again, um, we're hosting our Christmas bird count for the Nokesville Circle on Wednesday, December 27th. Um, Gary, were you planning on joining us? Uh, yeah, I usually do. Uh, well, in case something happens, though, but I, I do with uh, Tim Stamps, uh, okay. the uh, Quantico. Okay. Okay. And Perfect. one. I, uh oh! Actually, one year <laughs> something happened that we didn't get, couldn't get together. Mm. So my son Matt and I uh, did it by ourselves, and we were over by uh, Cindy's Cindy's house and did the uh, the uh, area along the stream there. And we had evening roast beaks, which was unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, I had them. I had them once too at a oh gosh. In, my, in my spot. Yeah. Oh, and I had uh, and I had uh, cedar wax wings today too. Good, yeah, around good. Yeah, you don't always see them. Can you like see a ton of them, or you don't see any? <laughs> it's like yeah. One more there. All right. Any other uh, questions in there, or just more uh, this... comments? Comments? Questions? Uh, yeah, this is Jack again. I hey, I was going to say I live on an unnamed stream to Lake Omasol, so I've I've seen the. The uh, is it the barred owl? We have red fox. We have all kinds of things nice. back there, and I swear there's a young falcon that kind of grew up in our backyard. He's very friendly, and he'll stop on the tree. I think it's a falcon and not a. Yeah, uh, there were a couple of falcons I didn't mention. I didn't mention. I, yeah, yeah, I have time to do every bird, but there are kestrels yes. and merlins, which are smaller falcons. Yes, my grandson. Uh, uh, he th drew the falcon. He was there for 25, 30 minutes. And so he was quite unusual. And he was able to draw him in detail. So was that he was more, um, was he more like colorful, like with red on it? Or or is it more uh, gray uh, with streaks? I, uh, well, let me see. I have. Let me look. OK. <laughs> Just curious what kind of falcon it was. Sounds like he was in elementary school, but it was sort of okay, yeah, like that. Oh, okay, uh, that's probably a Merlin, yeah, a Merlin. Oh, yeah. okay, thank you. I but I, I really was impressed with his skills to at yeah. a young age to do that. That's great. So, oh, that was really nice. My guess is it's a Merlin, I can't say yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you very I much, Larry. Cool, Russ, what were you saying? I just wanted to comment when you were mentioning about the, the hawks that were around. I'm not sure who, if you guys know Nathan. He saw a goshawk this past week up up in the mountains. You had mentioned about. Yeah, sometimes in the mountains you can get them. Yeah, so he had, I, I, I remembered when, when you mentioned that, I was like, he saw them this week. It was, you know, yeah, but not, but not, not in Prince William County. <laughs> no, 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 for sure not. No way. Right, right. Yeah, I'm trying to keep them mostly ones you like, you could see in Prince William. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I've never been oh, to Virginia. They're, they're pretty, I've seen them in the West. I have it on my list, but not, not, uh, not in Virginia. Yeah. Ashley. Yeah. Did you talk to your dad about the uh, teal that he saw? Oh no, I haven't. I haven't. Tell me, tell me about it. Well, it's I don't <laughs> exactly. know. It was a, di a different colored teal. It wasn't. Oh. Okay. You know, her, her dad saw it, so you know it. It was different. <laughs> okay. Uh, I thought the different one was where the stripe is not vertical, but right. the other direction. Yeah, that's oh, the no, that's, 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 that's that's the green wing teal. That's the Eurasian, but this is right. Oh, okay. like a cinnamon teal. Yeah, no, I wasn't. It, that's the only other teal I'm aware. Of. I mean, I it's got it. I got aberrant it. color. It might be Captain and Tennille. Yeah, that's right. How'd you know? <laughs> ah, no crazy. One can crazy. Uh -huh. <laughs> anyway, moving on. <laughs> We've got uh, a lot right. of good puns. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I, I was going a few. It was fun. It, it was two thirds of a pun. P U. <laughs> hey, you know, gotta throw them. <laughs> hey, I actually, I, I actually restrained myself. Actually. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, and this was a really great introduction, All especially right. for anyone who is starting to learn about birds. And um, mm -hmm. and it's it can be a little overwhelming when you're starting to learn and there's so many birds to learn. Right. And it mm -hmm. is a skill. And so, um, Larry, this is a great way for people to, you know, these are the common species. So it's a, a great entry point to know kind of like what to kind of whittle down a little bit of what you can expect to see. And that can be right. really helpful um, when when you're learning a new skill. And even if you have you're pretty knowledgeable, it can it can be really helpful in the identification process of of knowing a little bit more about what you can expect to see based on the time of year the habitat and things like that and that is definitely um, all knowledge and information that goes into um, identifying birds in the field all right yeah, yeah so i would recommend yes. um i would recommend having a field guide though like a sibley or national geographic um Seems like a lot of people are maybe being a little over reliant on Google Lens or Merlin Photo ID, and they're uh, like it's telling them things that are just aren't here. But if you have a field guide, <laughs> you'll know what's expected here, so yeah. that yeah. helps. And then you can compare the different uh, species, so it helps you helps you learn. Yeah, I will say Merlin in the um, Sound ID has been really helpful. It's not. 100% by any stretch no, of the imagination. That's for sure. But it definitely helps narrow things down. And yeah. then they have really great recordings that you can listen and verify and just right. start to train your ear. And, and, yeah. and right. those tools can be helpful, but definitely you shouldn't rely on them as like 100%. Um, yeah. And and uh, you can consult with <laughs> with experts because it, it picks up, it misidentifies things on uh, occasion too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Elton actually, uh, the eBird reviewer doesn't actually accept uh, Merlin only IDs. So. Good. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. Just, just out. Out. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. it's a, I mean, that's for a rare bird. If it's a common bird, it's fine. But no. Exactly. So, anyway. All right. Any other comments or uh, thoughts? I appreciate everyone's time. <laughs>